From the beginning, the story has been told by the elders to the young. The story of the coming of the first people to this earth, the meeting with Masao, the creator. These are his words. Martin Gashwa Sioma was born in Haute Villa, nephew of Yukiuma, a religious leader who led a small band of Hopis who were evicted from Oribe because they wished to follow the traditional way of life. They founded Haute Villa in 1906. In their new home, the religious exiles have kept the breath and the life of the Hopi prophecy. Masa owns this land over here. We met him in Old Oribe, and then he gave us permission to live here with him and give us this knowledge to take care of this world for him. So this really belongs to the great spirit, Masa. This is the great spirit holding the world right here. This is the line that he gave them the path through here. This is a good life all the way to here. If you follow my footsteps, you will live a long life. Before the white man came, they already knew that someday somebody will come around, a white man that take over their land and claim it. White men split them here. This is the road of the white man through here, all the way to here. The elders say this is a uh, rocky road here. They don't know where this leads to. They said this, this only leads to the destruction of this world. <laughs> then there are some people are still following the footsteps of the Great Spirit through here. <laughs> Tom Tarbett of Santa Fe, New Mexico, is a longtime student of the Hopi. He is director of the Planting Stick Project and acts as liaison between two very different cultures. At first, they were united all across the entire array of villages in one web, just because they'd all been following the same cosmic song that put them in their places. Uh, so the United States couldn't break that unity at first, but eventually they started breaking down until Oribe itself split. Roy Stevens, who is from Indonesia, describes himself as a biocosmologist. He is part of the Society of Hopi and Planetary Friends. Their mission is to help the world understand the wisdom of the Hopi. The Hopi, of course, they were also forewarned about you know, the intrusions by modern civilization, by modern man. And so they, when, when, it, when it came, right away they saw, you know, uh, where the danger come from, came from. There was education. Because they want us to live like a white people. This is what broke everything. The religious, what we believe in, and everything. 1880, they built a boarding school up there in Kim's Canyon. 1887, 
Around the turn of the century, assimilation of native peoples into the mainstream of American society was the official policy of the United States government. The two leaders over here in Ola Raibi, they fell for it. They got weak and said it was okay for the kids to go to school, but Yukima and some of other religious leaders were against it. And the prophets who realized that the new system they were being offered was not in accord with what Masao had taught them about survival, was in fact leading to doom, were brutally evicted by the faction that naively took the modern world to be a safe bet. One morning, they just now sat down to eat. And they arrived, those people from Keynes, and some from the Polaka, and from the old Oribe. Generally speaking, it's the law that everyone, every American child goes to school. And in certain respects, in certain parts of our history, this was uh, a valuable thing to prevent child abuse. And they took all the people out from their houses. They dragged them, took all the men, they tear their shirt off, pull their shirt off, tear them up. So they knew all the way to begin that education was not such a good thing because the Hopi, their education was definitely superior but the fact that they didn't have hospitals at the time because people were really healthy, they were strong. People, men used to run 40 miles in one day straight to the fields and back. <laughs> they were champions. They didn't have jails, they didn't have prisons, they didn't need uh, to rely on all kind of uh, administrative buildings and surfaces and so on. They were self-reliant. That's what the power is. It's not, it's not only the power of the Hopi, that should be also the power of every individual. Throw them around, push them around, pulling their hair, things like that, even the ladies. Some of them took out their weapons and other other things, and that's when they start to fight back. And one of the from from Tupa, I don't know his English name, but his name is Bayeste. He came around with his white horse, and he got mad. He said, what are you people doing? Why are you fighting for? What are you fighting for? They didn't do anything just because they don't want to live like a white people. I want to stop. So he went around and whipped all those people with his, uh, how do you call that whip. thing? Whip. So that's how he cleared this off. Okay. All right, come on, you go. You better go. Come on, take a step. That's what they were saying to my grandpa. Okay. The leaders from Ola Raibi drew a line that that land belongs to Ola Raibi. And then whoever wants to follow Yukima and, and uh, the leaders, they step over the line. When Yukima stepped over the line, he went like this meaning this whole world belongs to the creator, not to the newcomer. Then they started from there. And moved over to Hotvilla, about four miles, more or less northeast. Um, and in effect, took the Oribe spiritual union into exile. The ragged band of exiles reached the other side of Third Mesa, where Haute Villa now stands. They had not been permitted to take their belongings with them. So he stood there and took one, some of this cornmeal and he went around like this, make a circle around it. And he went inside of that. And he said, this is where I'm going to stay. This is where I'm going to stay with my daughter, my only daughter. So that's where they settle. They clear off the little places around there where they could stay for a while. And they build a fire. 
And they fed around each place just like that. That's where they gathered all the men together and then they marched them up to Kim's Canyon. It's about 35 miles from, from, from here where the agency is. Then they put them in prison. They asked them to sign some kind of a, some kind of paper, but they refused to sign it. And they told them if they signed the paper, they would give them food, but they still refused to sign the papers. And then after that, they took them to the blacksmith and they chained them together in pairs. That's where they forced them to build the road over in Kim's Canyon. Then when night nighttime com comes around, they would chain it, you know, hook them up, six six people together. If some one person wants to use uh, the art house, all six have to go with them. Their ankles start getting sores on them, blood on them. Still they're going like that. I shed all my tears for him, all that years, since I was a kid. Then the woman, it was really hard for them to, to survive over there during winter, winter, winter days. And they survived by hunting and picking greens. And so, of course, again, they went in. The day that they wanted to take us over there, our fathers, they hold us. We're sitting in front of them, and they hold us. They don't want us to go, but they fight with us. They took their hands away from her like this. Come on, come on. You have to go. They have to go. They dragged us over there. I went. My father was holding. My uncle Dan was right here. They literally kidnapped the children, took them literally, torn them apart away from the mother's parents' arms and put them in, in camps. You know, we call this boarding uh, schools, but actually they were concentration camps for years. If I remember right, that was David, Lester, my sister Viola, that's one of my older sisters, and Helen, Zelma, Lloyd, and that forced them to uh, adopt, uh, to get tuned into a different mode, see, of uh, life through education. They were forced, you know, to, to eat the white man's way, to dress the white man's way, to think the white man's way. They were severely beaten and, and punished, you know, when they just mentioned one hopey word. They used to have long dresses, long sleeves, like this kind of sweater they used to have, and a club. And they have a little uh, red cap on, you know. Like a little red riding hood, you might just as well say. And they took already my grandpa down there before they did that to us. To prison? Yeah. California, uh. Cortez. Yeah, some of them came back, and then on top of it, they took them back again and took to, took them to Alcatraz. Well, now, if you wanted to see the Hopi culture, now you'd have to imagine a pot that was set on a highway and run over by a truck. These two lines right here, these are two hearted people that are destroying the land. They're gonna, I mean, they're 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 gonna destroy this world. So this, this one line here, there's a man right here that someday this, this man will wake up. This is the one line means that he's a one-hearted. 
Now, the Hopi are one of the last living examples who have a culture that installs wisdom and power, that gives the leadership capability or commission from the people to the person with the greatest wisdom to carry it out. But if this guy wakes up in time, then he would try to bring, bring them back to this creator's way so that the world will be safe. But if we don't do anything, then the world will be destroyed. The Hopi nation has never been conquered by an army. They have never signed a treaty with any government. Therefore, they consider themselves sovereign. Um, the people who, who were educated, children, see they created a great gap and they got accustomed to, to the comforts and so-called progression. From there, they created uh, today uh, the so-called Hopi Tribal Council, see, which was not only illegally installed, but they also provided the, the material, you know, uh, the people for the creation of an agency that served the interest of government and big business. So that is the great dilemma right now in Hopi land. In 1936, an election was held. Traditional Hopis refused to participate in the white people's electoral process. As a result, the tribal council was established by the votes of a minority of voting Hopis. Today, only five of the 12 Hopi villages have chosen to be represented on the tribal council. This puppet government is replacement for whatever traditional government would have, ex would have existed. And uh, it's the rubber stamp, it's the signature on the contracts by which the minerals are taken away. Because the uh, council or any in Indian bureau, it didn't ask any permission from, from the Hope Hopis that are leaders. It is ruled by the Secretary of Interior. That's in their constitution. It's in the Tribal Council Constitution that he has the final yay or nay over anything that the Tribal Council government does. I think it's going to come out since we have a uh, few documents how, how the government created this council over here. We wanted to abolish the council then if, if we clean this mess over here, get rid of the council, all the other native people will be free too. In 1882, a reservation was set aside for the Hopi. It included lands that were occupied by members of the Navajo tribe. Centered on coal-rich Black Mesa, this area later became known as the Joint Use Area. Congress divided the Joint Use Area between the two tribes in 1974. Thousands of Navajos caught on the wrong side of the fence were forced by law to move. Some are ignoring the order and refuse to relocate either from the partition land or from the Peabody Coal Company lease area. The coal, strip mined from Black Mesa, is used to fire power plants which, in turn, provide electricity for southwestern cities. They opened that mine to, um, to employ some people up there for the jobs for the local people. We knew that Someday, that uh, this, uh, these ignorant, greedy people will start mining this before they go on. And right now, if you go up to the mining area, they say that what kind of experience do you have? And you gotta have some kind of experience, like heavy equipment or some kind of experience on mining um, to get a job up there. They never, the government never asked us and then put up this Hopi Tribal Council. So what they're doing is everything is illegal. Moving the Navajo people out and strip mining over here. People disagree with the mining ever since then because of the 
there's a lot of wrongdoing that the company has been doing to the uh, uh, culture and the religion belief and also to the uh, uh, contaminating the land, water, the air. The people were talking about it, yeah, because that whole Black Mesa is a sacred ground. There's a lot of areas up on Black Mesas are, uh, have uh, the herbal medicine that they use to cure sickness and use for the ceremonies, and also like tobaccos for the ceremony. So that's the way the pe people look at it is uh, they want to the whole Peabody out of Black Mesa. So uh, so-called prophecy is actually is not some not uh, something mysterious, it's just like common sense. We know, you know, what can happen. Like we know that after uh, winter, spring will come. If we don't follow those instructions, if we get off of that instructions, the world might turn over if we're not purified. Oh, by this way, we are going to be able to do it, but we are going it already started. The nature's already telling us the earthquakes, and this winter the flowers has bloomed. That means that that we're real close to the purification. So we already started. We're already starting the purification. But yet, in the glory of all this uh, technology and and might that we have acquired, um, we remain blind. Certain things happen <coughs> in the past that tell us something's happening to the land and life and the people. And the plant life also tell us, flowers, different types will tell us also that something is happening and something is coming soon. We came to live in peaceful way upon this continent or this land of life the Great Spirit gave us. We were not to fight each other. We are not to create and destroy things senselessly. We all have certain religious instructions, but it seems some different religious groups, societies, seem to have forgotten those basic instructions, teachings, and warnings, and are doing something just the opposite, running after more things that are not in line with the law of great spirit of lost nature and creating this problem. We are all given instructions to take care of this land and life according to the law of the great spirit of law of nature. And that is what I'm doing. And I hope that you leaders or you who are belonging to some society that may be able to help correct these things, better hurry up and look into this and correct them as soon as possible. We are really in deep, deep, deep trouble right now. And it's time that modern society, governments, people, everyone, right, make a serious, serious beginning in respecting not only nature, but the people who have protected nature, like indigenous people, and redeem, atone. And we cannot say, well, it's not one of my concern because uh, somebody did the stealing and the murdering for me so many generations ago. The fact that we are enjoying wealth, this technology and the resources, that doesn't take away that we don't have any more responsibility. I see um, the, the return, uh, successful return to the nature war, or that means voluntarily, not by force because nature will force us into that if we don't do it ourselves, is to empower um, the Aboriginal people, not just only the Native American, but all over the world, Australia, Africa, whatever is left of that wisdom, of that knowledge, that education. So if we fix this right, 
then maybe a few people will be safe around this world, not just here in Hopi, but all, all around the world, that will survive this purification. And we would all meet here in this continent, which we call heaven. Then all the people will come up to, to Hopi Nation to start a new life and live a long, happy, lasting life. After that, there will be no wars, anything like that. We will live in peace and start a new life again. This is, this is, this is what Martin has told me. So we need to start working for the, the Creator to survive this world. Um, <laughs> Poatan, <laughs> 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 <laughs>